cosecant, secant, or cotangent. I'll show you why we won't do those. Uh, basically, well, I'll graph them at the very end, uh, why we're not going to do them. So we'll get right into tangent. So we'll do a graph of tangent. So if we graph the regular period of tangent, that can I ask you tangent or cotangent in your quiz? Tangent. Regular tangent. So there was, of course, transformations, but the standard tangent period starts at 0, ends at 0, and that's pi. And we have a vertical asymptote, pi over 2. So if I took this right here as the, uh, as the period we use, what would I have to do to make this function one-to-one? -one? How much do I need to delete? It's almost one-to-one. -one. So yeah, I can't have both y values of zero. So I've got to make a choice. So if I inverted this period, I would cut out that x-intercept right there. Now this is a little bit of a pain because there's two pieces. So I'd have a graph my inverse graph would have two pieces in it. So let's be a little smarter about what we get rid of. I'm going to graph another half period to the left. So if I think about the period between negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, is that 1 to 1 inside the vertical asymptotes? So that'll pass the horizontal line test. So let's go ahead and use that one, and we'll throw out all that stuff down there. And of course, everything outside those vertical asymptotes. So we're going to restrict right here to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. We get a nice uh, continuous graph. There's no vertical asymptotes inside of our graph here. So there are some at the edge, and we'll worry about that in a minute. So we're restricting. Let's give this a better name than a Y. I'll call it f, f of x. So I want to restrict domain to, now I cannot use the closed interval because I would be divided by 0 right there. So I can't go all the way to negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. I have to stop before I hit negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So we're going to go open interval. So it's the only domain that's open that we restricted to. The other ones, we included all the endpoints. So if you write this out, our new f of x is really tangent restricted to the open interval negative pi over 2, positive pi over 2 of x. So this is domain of tangent, which is the range of tangent inverse. So we know what our range of tangent inverse is already. What about the range of regular tangent? So we have the graph of tangent that we restricted, the domain. What is the range of tangent in this graph? So we get all real numbers, negative infinity, positive infinity. There's no minimum, maximum. So our range of tangent, regular tangent, is negative infinity, positive infinity. And this is, of course, the domain of tangent inverse. So this domain and range are very different than the other domain and ranges we had. Both of them are open, but in here, our domain of tangent inverse is actually all real numbers. So that's going to be a little strange. We're going to invert the same way we did before. I'm going to go with blue, y equals x line. And we're going to reflect. So the good news is 0, 0 stays where it is. This one, at least for me, is easier to visualize reflecting. Our vertical asymptotes are going to be reflected to horizontal asymptotes. And then that curve that bends upwards like this, I just uh, label with blue, that's going to bend, instead of, it'll bend rightwards instead of upwards. So that's how our tangent graph is going to change when we invert it. So let's go ahead and do that now. I'm 
gonna zoom in a little bit. Hopefully you have the tangent graph already written down. So with our tangent inverse graph, we still get the point zero, zero. We have now two asymptotes, but they're horizontals. And they are y equals negative pi over two and y equals positive pi over two. And our graph is gonna go mostly rightwards as we, as we go right, we'll go up and then down to the left and approaching these asymptotes. So there's our graph of tangent inverse x. And we wrote down domain of the range already, but you can see it pretty clearly on the graph. Now we're going to write down our algebra rules here. So these functions will cancel out. Just like before, you have to make sure the inside function is allowed to eat the x. So the inside function, what is the domain of tangent inverse? You can see it on the graph. Tangent inverse domain is all x values. So this will be all real numbers, x. So they can, these cancel out for all when x is between negative infinity and positive infinity. So there's really no restriction when they cancel out like this. When we go in the other order, they will cancel out, but we have to be more careful. Tangent x, regular tangent, we restricted the domain to negative pi over two, pi over two. So that's not very many x values. So there's our algebra cancellation rules. I could ask you a tangent, inverse tangent of some number, and you have to figure out what number uh, will correspond to, but it works really similar to the sine inverse sine or cos inverse cos, so I'm not gonna go through the same type of problems. And what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna, we're gonna solve for an inverse function that's complicated, that has a few different transformations in it. Anybody remember how to find the inverse of a function? I think there was two steps we had to do. Yep, so we gotta change x and y, but there's no y here. So what is, how does y play into this? Yeah, y is f of x, so the f of x, so we got a y equals three, 10, All right, so inverse Now before we find the inverse, you have to check is f 1 to 1 and then swap x and y and then you solve for y. So the two steps you're familiar with, but we have to make sure our function's 1 to 1. We know tangent's not normally one to one. Good news is we can graph this function pretty easily. So we know how to graph this. So I'm gonna graph it first, and then we're gonna restrict the domain to make sure it's one to one. And we're gonna pick a smart domain. We get to choose. So we'll try to choose one that includes zero. And if we can't get zero in there, we'll choose the uh, next positive interval past zero. So if I wanna graph, graph this, So first thing, factor so 
So we factor our 2 out. Instead of uh, shifting right pi, we actually shift right pi over 2. All right, period. P equals regular pi over A. And of course here, A is 2. So our period is just pi over 2. So we shift right pi over 2. Our period is pi over 2. So we're going to go to 2 pi over 2. And we have vertical asymptote right in between. Hey, look, our function is almost 1 to 1. That's not a very friendly period, though. So let's try to get 0. We'll draw another period on, to the left of this. So this is the period that we would normally draw. If I gave you this on the quiz, this is what I would expect most of you to have right here. Oh, I didn't do the one last thing. Two last things. I have to stretch by 3 and then shift it down 1. So I'm going to skip those steps right there. So let's forget that. Uh, we'll forget the minus 1 and the forget that 3 right there. So we're just going to graph that part. So I'm going to graph another period here. We have another vertical asymptote. So we have x equals pi x equals 0. Uh-oh, that's not a vertical asymptote. What is the actual vertical asymptote that I should have drawn? So I should. So this one was This one was 3 pi, 3 pi over 4. The one I should have drawn was pi over 4. Remember, fractions suck unless you go common denominator. I probably should have gone fourths, and then you see we'd have 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4, and everything would have lined up nicely right there. If you don't go common denominator, how do you find a number between two numbers? So I'll give you two numbers. How do you find the number between? Average them together. So add them, divide by 2. So you add up. Pi over 2 and 2 pi over 2, you get 3 pi over 2, cut it in half, 3 pi over 4. So that'll be the halfway point between those two numbers. And we get this part of the graph and also that part. We're almost there. I'm going to do another half period to the left so we can include 0 in our domain and make it the biggest uh, period that makes this, this still has a continuous graph. So I'm going to throw away all that stuff and everything that would have happened out there. So we're going to go negative pi over 4 to pi over 4. That's our domain. So this is the domain of, what did I call this, F. Domain F is this interval, and that's the range of F inverse. Now, I didn't really stretch it or shift it vertically, but you can still tell me the range of F, even without doing any vertical transformations. What's the range of F? What Y values does F hit? It's going to hit all of them. Even if I stretch it three times bigger and moved it up one, it's still going to hit every single y value. That's not going to change. So we go minus infinity, positive infinity, and there's our range of f. And of course, that's the domain of f inverse. So I got the domain and range of the inverse function. And now we're going to do the algebra to invert it. Now this is going to be a little bit tricky. It's going to use what you learned in pre-calculus 1 with finding inverses and carefully inverting the trig function. So if I label these 1 and 2, we're going to do, of course, 1 first. So swap x and y. I have x equals 3 tan 2. It doesn't matter which form I go with. 
I could do the factored form or not factored form. That doesn't matter. Whoa, that should be a Y. So I like to think about solving for a variable like rescuing it. So we're going to get y by itself. So I have to kick everything else out of the right side. Now I have to do it carefully. When in doubt, you go up this ladder right here. So we're going to go up the PEMDAS ladder. What is the first operation I'm going to undo? There's two places I'm subtracting. I have a minus 3 and I have a minus pi. Which one do I take care of first? Uh, not minus 3, geez. Minus 1 or a minus pi? Which one do I take care of first? Minus 1. The pi, it is a minus pi, but that minus is inside parentheses. So I have to deal with the parentheses before I can do that minus pi. So I undo the minus 1 by adding 1. So it's x plus 1 equals 3 tan 2y minus pi. So that's my addition subtraction. Now I'm going to go for multiplication division. So that times 3, we're going to unmultiply by 3. So that's x plus 1 over 3 equals tangent 2y minus pi. So here's the tricky part. I need to get the tangent function out of here. So how do I move a function to the other side of an equation? Inverse functions. So we're going to write tangent inverse. So we're going to move it to the other side with tangent inverse. So we get tangent inverse of x plus 1 over 3 equals 2y minus pi. What is the next step? Remember, we're trying to rescue y. So we're going to get the 2 and the minus pi out of here. What do I do first? So we're going to add pi. So now we don't have parentheses, so I can just do addition and subtraction before I go take care of the multiplication. So I'm going to add the pi. And last step, multiply everything by a half. So you could either write some big fraction over 2, or you could write it as 1 half times tan inverse x plus 1 over 3 plus pi. And this is, if we did everything right, this should be f inverse of x when you're done and you got y by itself. What we're going to do now is graph this thing. So we're going to take it over to food plot. We're going to graph the original, graph this, and hopefully we can see that the graphs are uh, inverses of each other. All right, so I'm struggling right here. Connect. Okay, so you hopefully have graphed on foo, plot, foo plots a few times, so you can go and graph those two functions. Remember, the tangent's going to have like whatever six periods, or depending on your window. So you're going to have to think about what period we actually used, and then look at how that one turns around in inverse.